Good evening. Welcome to the May 12th meeting of the Granville Exempted Village School District Board of Education. It's um, 6.30. Um, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please. Dr. Corman. Here. Ms. Deeds. Here. Mr. Janice. Here. Mr. Miller. Here. Dr. Rentel. Here. Commendations? Commendations. All right. Hi, most of you are here. Tonight we are going to start by recognizing the Granville High School bands and choirs. Both groups achieved superior ratings at the Regional Ohio Music Education Association competition which qualified them to compete at the state competition May 2nd. Under the direction of instructors Jared Smith and Andrew Crum, our bands achieved excellent ratings at the state competition. All choirs directed by Kristen Snyder came home with superior ratings. We have invited the group's presidents along with their teachers to be honored for their dedication and hours of practice it took to achieve these results. I am proud to say that each year our instructors provide high quality, effective instruction and mentorship, which enables our pool of talented students to keep growing. So I'd like our representatives from the band, Aaron Crack, Ashley Hart, co-presidents, and instructors Jared Smith and Andrew Crum to come up, and then I'm going to do the choir, and we're going to take pictures at each point, and then um, we'll do band and choir, sorry. Okay? So, Aaron and Ashley, if you can. All right. And then we have three of the honorees that participated in the symphonic um, choir. Yes, okay. So Brian Janice, Heather Winley, and Ivy Gilbert. Band. But now um, we're going 
to recognize some members of our drama group. Most, if not all of us in the room uh, tonight have enjoyed the entertainment this next group provides to the community. Students involved in the drama club dedicate countless hours to learning and perfecting their craft under the leadership of the club presidents and the direction of their hard-driving club advisors. Tonight, we recognize the students who volunteer to take on leadership roles in the club. They provide support and serve as role models to their peers. None of this would be possible, however, without the dedication and direction the students receive from their club advisors. Sarah, Tim, and Stephanie form a strong team of teachers who shape and cultivate the talent of the students in this club. From stage crew and lighting to makeup, publicity, and acting, we honor this club for offering every student participant the opportunity to reach their potential and to shine. So I'd like to invite Dan H Daniel Hussey and Sarah Emery, co-presidents, Sarah Sharp, Tim is over at the orchestra, and uh, Stephanie Stan. So, job right. well done. Yeah. So, um, our next honoree is a staff member. Is she here? Mm -hmm. Amy Fulton? Oh, there she is. Okay, we're hiding. Um, she is uh, an educator who has dedicated her career to funding, uh, finding and nurturing the talents of her students. Granville High School teacher Amy Fulton is this year's recipient of the Patel for Kids Celebrating Teaching Award. This award is given each year to a class of educators who provide superior quality instruction, which enables students not only the opportunity to learn, but also to provide pathways for growth. Amy was chosen for this award based on input from Principal Ryan Burnett, coupled with achieving at least three years of above expected growth from her students in English classes. Please join me in honoring this educator who prepares her students well to succeed and excel upon grad graduation. Again, uh, my name is Donovan O'Neill. I'm the Central Ohio Regional Liaison for uh, State Auditor Dave Dosal. I appreciate you all coming out here to see me tonight <laughs> in my presentation. Um, all, uh, all things serious, though, our office is responsible. For those of you who aren't aware, take, let's take advantage when we have a larger group of folks from the public. Most of you may not know that you have a State Auditor's Office. For those of you who don't, uh, our job is to, under the direction of Auditor Dave Yost, is to go across the state of Ohio uh, and for the 5,800 public ent entities that are funded through taxpayer dollars, we're responsible for auditing each and every one of them uh, and ensuring that the dollars, uh, the hard-earned dollars that you pay into those uh, public agencies, your cities, your school districts, your county governments, are being spent appropriately. And when they're not being spent appropriately, uh, we recover those dollars uh, and, and ensure that they go towards their proper public purpose. Oftentimes our office is involved when there's not so good things going on, uh, and when you see our faces, you really don't want to see our faces. 
Um, but one of the joys of this job, and one of the things we really like to be able to do is go out and congratulate uh, folks like Treasurer Sobel and his staff uh, and Granville Schools uh, for really going above and beyond and achieving what only 5% of that 5,800 uh, public entities in the state of Ohio were able to do in getting this Auditor of State Award with distinction. Uh, so on behalf of Auditor of State Dave Yost, I'd like to present this Auditor of State Award with distinction to Mike Sobel, Granville Exempt Village School District Treasurer. This award is given only to those entities that file timely financial reports with the Auditor of State in accordance with GAAP as well as receive a clean audit report. A clean audit report means that your financial audit contains no findings for recovery, material citations, material weaknesses, significant deficiencies, single audit findings, or any question costs. Basically, as far as our folks can tell, the dollars and cents add up and there's a, uh, there's a good accounting of the finances. In addition to doing all that, and having our folks come in and do that work, to get this, this award with distinction, uh, they must complete a comprehensive annual financial report, which is really the gold standard uh, in governmental accounting. This award is a testament to clean and accurate record keeping, which is, again is the foundation for good fiscal management. And the Board of Education can take pride in Treasurer Sobel and his staff for their commitment to financial accountability. Congratulations once again on receiving the Auditor of State Award. And on behalf of Auditor of State Davios, we look forward to continuing to work with you to ensure clean, accountable, and efficient government. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> section is over feel free you're not going to hurt our feelings I know the Denison students have to stay um, to hear the presentation and yes I did just turn down the air um, we are going to be talking about energy policy so we have an eighth grader we're going to get rid of I understand well, right, take care Jeff, before the um, board updates, do you know if the GEF officially approved the slate of four awards for this spring yet? Yes, we got the money already. There's four different awards this for this spring? Grants? Grants? The grants? Four grants this spring? I know we've already the gotten GEF? one for Rethel and Cosmo. Okay. Okay. I see we've gotten all of them. I don't know why those in last. I really don't know. I wasn't at the last meeting. Okay. I, Tina, right. will, Tina will know if we got the money. I bet they didn't come, money didn't come in yet. No, I think it did. we got the money for Rethel. Because they were trying to coordinate with a couple other people or something like that. Was that last year? I thought that was this year. I think it was last year. Yeah. Oh, because okay. I thought we just got the show. Okay. Yeah. Very good. I won't overbill it then. All right. <laughs> All right. All right. Definitely. Next, I'd like to introduce a couple of our Denison students here. Um, that in all, there were 17 Denison students, all juniors, that as part of the requirements for their environmental practicum, worked as a consultant for us on a real world project. Um, they learned a lot of great lessons through this process. Um, they spent the semester working with the school district on a set of different energy issues. It started out with a straight A fund grant application. And they realized exactly how governments work because <laughs> the, the criteria for the straight A fund grant proposal changed about uh, a month or two into the project and um, completely had to reshape how they put their proposal together. But we did submit a straight A fund proposal um, to the state of Ohio that was a partnership with this group. So I'd like to thank them first. And then um, next, they started looking at potential House Bill 264 projects that will um, help us inform our uh, future decision making. And then finally, they started working on our energy policy. So with that, I want to thank Dr. Abram Kaplan, sitting back there, you can say hi, and the rest of the students for their work on this project, and I'll turn it over to them to share with us their findings. Thank you, Mr. 
Mr. Brown. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Whitney. Um, thank you all for your time inviting us here. We understand there's a lot on the agenda, so we appreciate you sneaking us in here. Um, but as Mr. Brown said, we are here on behalf of the Environmental Studies class um, at Denison University, and we've been working really closely with the district throughout the whole semester, but most recently, as Mr. Brown said, working on updating and enhancing the district's energy policy. So based on the current energy policy that Granville uses and based on our research with other energy policies throughout other um, districts in Ohio and around the United States, we've created a new proposed, uh, proposed energy policy with these four overarching goals. So the first, we wanted to reflect Granville's current energy picture by determining any extraneous or necessary energy uses. Second, we made decisions based um, on the district's goal of reducing the utilities cost per square foot to $1.15. And third, we provided curricular ties to the energy policy to ensure its visibility and success throughout the district. And finally, um, our proposed document hopes to encourage an ethic of environmental and economic sustainability throughout the district. So based on these four overarching goals, um, we just wanted to make sure we convey to you why we think this new energy policy is a good idea. So first and foremost, this energy policy does ensure reduction of both energy consumption and the reduction of costs as well. So this policy has curricular components that encourages educational collaboration among students, faculty, administration, and staff throughout the district. And finally, in adopting this policy, Granville will continue to be a leader among the country's top school districts throughout the country um, through the commitment of this energy policy and the uh, ties to the curriculum as well. Oh, sorry. Uh, so just a little brief introduction to our presentation. We'll be discussing the additions to the proposed energy, pol energy policy, first being the accountability section, which ranges from individual to communal-wide um, responsibility based on our energy use. Second, we added a curriculum and communication section that focuses on how the policy will be integrated within the curriculum, as well as distributed throughout the community. And we also focused on making the energy policy more specific through all of our sections that we have created and also through the sections that have been the existing energy policy as well. <laughs> okay, hi, I'm Grace, and I'm gonna be talking a little bit about uh, the specific things that we've talked about uh, for reducing the energy consumption within the school district. So the transition to LED lights, and this was something that was really stressed when we spoke with Jeff and Kathy and Frank uh, for the straight A fund, and we felt like that was something that should keep going on as long as it's economically feasible. Uh, specifying the guidelines of HDAC use, we found that this is a big energy waster and we want to make sure that it's operated in the most economically and environmentally sustainable way. Uh, the reduction of small appliances just applies to both in classrooms and then also in offices. Uh, encouraging sustainable transportation options, so students that live closer to school, encouraging them to ride bikes, to walk to school, and then also incentivizing carpooling. And we want to make sure that all of this complements the House Bill 264 that we were working on. Okay, so the curriculum and communication ties, we want to make sure that everyone within the school district is not only aware of the energy policy, but it's part of their everyday lives. It's something that they're, you know, kind of always having to implement. So the carbon footprint quiz, this is something that's going to be taken at the beginning of the year by everyone within the school district. And this is just going to serve as a baseline so that we can figure out where individual energy usage is happening and how that impacts a carbon footprint. And then it's going to be taken at the end of the year in order to see how this energy policy is impacting the students, whether or not they're uh, reducing their individual energy use and how that's impacting the score. Now, social media will be taking advantage of the pre-existing um, Twitter and Facebook page just to keep people kind of constantly um, in the know with what's going on with the policy. Uh, and then also going on with the energy bulletin as well, that's just going to be emailing, so keeping people who are not within the school on a daily basis, letting them know what's happening with the energy policy. Visual displays without the school, kind of keeping it constantly in the minds of the students and the faculty about our policy. And then also the open forum. So at district-wide meetings or departmental meetings, we'll be allowing an open forum every two months just so people can ask questions and find out what the progress is with this energy policy. And then also, um, as Whitney said previously, we would like to encourage both individual and community-wide accountability. So an energy contract will be signed at the end of the year by everyone in the school district. 
So this is just saying that, um, you know, after going over the energy policy, basically saying they understand it, but they're also going to adhere to the guidelines, and it's something that they're going to promote to other people. Um, an energy manager will be selected in every single school, and this is going to be someone who just makes sure that the policy is being upheld, and is going to be selected from the pre-existing faculty. Uh, the energy <coughs> committee is going to be made up of faculty, administrators, and students, and they're going to be discussing energy reduction in the school and their projects for increasing that within the school throughout the quarter. And then finally, the Energy Employee of the Month is going to be faculty members that are recognized for their commitment to this policy. Hi, I'm Sam. I'm going to be talking about models we use from Ohio public schools that have recently changed by energy policies. Um, so we looked at the Euclid schools and the Osborne School District, which is only about two hours away in New Canton, Ohio. Um, both these schools have made significant changes in their policy in the last five to 10 years and have experienced um, a great amount of success in their implementation. Uh, so we broke their success up into three parts of DC. Uh, the first being financial savings. For Osenberg, uh, their goal is saving $50,000 um, from just from energy costs, and they actually surpassed that within within a couple of years of their policy change. Euclid is a much bigger district, district than Granville or Osenberg, and they're saving $900,000 a year um, after only, only about five years from their implementation. So both of them clearly had a huge success financially. Um, energy reduction-wise, you could uh, replace many of their appliances and lighting systems and are, about, and are paying about half of what they are per watt of what they were before their implementations. <coughs> um, Osterberg focused on improving their building HVAC systems and they greatly improved their efficiency and the lifespan of, their, of their, all of their buildings is much longer. Uh, lastly, both these schools reported academic academic improvements since the implementation. The schools reported that the students are absent absent less. Uh, their the students and faculty reported to be more comfortable, and the students are actually getting better grades. Uh, overall, these policy changes improved the overall academic environment of the schools, and uh, also improved financially, obviously. And we believe that we can do the same for the Granville School District um, with our proposed implementation. Um, I'm Molly and I will be concluding this presentation this evening. Um, so first off, we wanted to touch on the collaboration between the Edison and the Granville School District. Our relationship was conducive to the rewrite of the policy and the willingness and encouragement um, for the rewrite of the policy and, and the school allowed us, um, our cost of research, to develop the policy in a new and environmentally conscious light. Also, um, if the occasion presented itself, um, Denison would really welcome the opportunity to work with uh, secondly, the Granville School District has made commitments uh, towards energy and cost efficiency in their efforts with the House Bill 264 and the Straight A Fund Grant proposal. The, reva the revamped energy policy is the next step towards a new, a new and sustainable future. Students and faculty will have the opportunity to become environmentally conscious thinkers. We also hope the, um, the curriculum connections will encourage students um, and faculty to participate in more sustainable behavior, and not only in the school district, but maybe at home as well. Um, and then to briefly reiterate the cost, um, or the benefits of the new policy, uh, the cost and energy savings of the policy, um, the majority of the savings would come from the installation of the LED lighting and the efficient practices highlighted in the lighting and HVAC sections of um, the new energy policy. Um, these long-term savings would ultimately allow more money to be allocated towards the classroom or towards whatever the district sees fit. And lastly, we would like to give a special thanks to the Granville School District for allowing us the opportunity to work with you. This has been an incredible and educational experience for the practicum class. Um, it has really opened a window into the professional realm. Um, especially, like to especially thank Jeff, Frank, and Kathy for their support and cooperation rewriting the proposed straight A proposal and the policy would not have been possible without their help. Um, once again, thank you for listening. And that concludes our presentation this evening. Um, and we are also going to have a short Q&A session, so feel free to ask questions or comments and our other classmates are available.
it's just fantastic the connection that we have with Denison and all the resources you guys put in. I mean, the number of hours that you've put touring our schools and looking at the lights and checking out our electrical bills and all those kinds of things is really going to pay off for sure. And the comments within the you know, energy policy that suggested, I especially like the educational components of it, right? Because that's what we're all about, right? Is the education piece of it. So to be able to connect with, with the, the university and be able to drive some of those lessons back down to our schools is fantastic. So again, just a big uh, vote of thanks for this. There's a lot of great content in here that I'm sure we'll be able to move forward. A lot of work went into this, and you know, I'm I'm excited about the collaboration between Denison and and Granville Schools, and hope it will continue. Um, the next steps are for our director of operations and Jeff to share this with the. Um, we have a resources and operations committee made up of community members and other faculty and teachers, um, so they will share this report with them, and then it comes back to us for the uh, for the recommendation. So um, it's not quite done, but we it's definitely a push in the right direction, and we really really appreciate all the effort and time that you've put into this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, they, they, their class was at 8.15 in the morning, <laughs> and they always came in with their cups of coffee and, <laughs> and their mats, and they yeah. s put them up and went to work. But, um, I know that you probably have things to do. Uh, Mr. Sobel's about to do the five-year forecast. You're welcome to stay, but I am also, Dr. Kaplan, it's up to you. <laughs> I don't want to treat them as hostages, so <laughs> if, they, if you want them to go, they can go. Okay, thank you. Great work, Abram. Thanks a lot. Yes, thanks, Abram. Thank you so much. Yes, please do. All right, next we have Mr. Sobel and <laughs> Give me two slides, I'll have the rest of them out of here. <laughs> um, it's a threat. Okay, five year forecast presentation. I will maybe try to make it a little shorter than I normally do. Um, what we're going to talk about a little bit, comparing it with the October forecast, and we'll look at enrollment, look at our basic um, revenue and expenditure um, estimates. And then please feel free to, as you will come in and be talking. Um, we'll start comparing it with the October forecast. Obviously, the big difference between now and the October forecast is the levy that we passed. Actually, both levies that we passed. Um, of course, in October, we were not allowed to include the revenue from the November um, levy in the forecast. So you can see that our general property and public utility property taxes are sharply higher than they were in October. Um, the unrestricted aid is a couple hundred thousand dollars higher than it was in October. Two things for that. One was $68,000 that we received when the state finalized last fiscal year's allocation. And that also built into the base for this year, so we kind of get a double thing there. And then also um, the way that the state treated all day kindergarten in the calculation of the state share indents is different. They end up treating it differently than I thought they would treat it, and actually treating it in a way that's to our benefit. Um, so we're allowed to count the all-day kids who are paying as part of our total ADM for calculating, which makes us poorer under the state formula, and so we're a little better off there. Um, the all other operating revenue is, is higher because of the TIF payment. Um, we didn't, in October, we didn't realize that, that, that the additional valuation was going into the TIF. Um, we thought it was coming on as new value as property taxes, so it actually was, most of that was in new property taxes in October. It's now part of the TIF um, that we've found out since then. 
On the expenditure side, there's very little difference um, from what we were forecasting back in October. Um, the personnel services are down a little bit. The purchase services are up a little bit. The biggest piece of that is because of the change in the operations director, where that went from being in December from being on salary to being a contracted service with ESCCO. That's the big change. The change in the, print, the principal interest and fiscal charges, the bond repayment. Um, in the October forecast, I realized I had it in the wrong place, and it really wasn't a bond payment, it was a transfer out. And so it's still in here, it's just not in that line item anymore, but it's the same expenditure. You look at our um, financial situation now with the passage of both levies um, and with the conclusion of the negotiated agreement, you can see we are much, much better off than we were than we were back in October. If you remember back in October, we were looking at a oper operating shortfalls throughout the period and pretty much running out of cash in two at the end of 2016. We are now running operating net operating revenue surpluses through 2016. 2017 is showing a very small shortfall, but that's really within rounding year of, of zero, $52,000. And then we don't start really, aren't looking at running a little bit more of a deficit until the last year of the five-year period. And that's an issue we'll start addressing probably at the end of this school year as we start looking forward and seeing where we are. Um, you look at the overall cash balance at the end of the five-year forecast period, we're expecting it to be above $3.6 million, uh, meaning that barring anything really unforeseen, um, there is no reason to expect that we will have to go to the ballot anytime during this five-year forecast period, hopefully a year or two after that, because um, we are in a good place and we'll continue to be keeping our eye on the tan bar here and keeping an eye on it as as long as we can, keeping our expenses within our revenues um, so that we can carry this out as far as, as, far as possible. Um, look at the projected cash flow, the graph we've been showing a lot. Is there were we, in January of, of this year, we were down to $417,000 of cash, not even enough to make a payroll. And now if you look at when we get to next January, that's expected to be well over $2 million, and so we are not facing the cash flow issues that we have been facing now really since Jeff and I have been here, um, are not facing those. If we actually had somewhere to invest money, it would give us some ability to do long-term investing, but at this point, rates are so bad, I've decided that's probably not in the best interest of the district to tie money up for very long in that, but at least it gives us a base should we have an opportunity for some more um, beneficial investments, I guess, to tie money up for the long term because we know now we're not going to be needing it in January just to make payroll. And, you know, that's really a good place to be, and we haven't been in that position in several years now. Um, switching gears, looking, let's get into enrollment, and then we'll get into the, the specifics. This is the current enrollment forecast. It is not a lot different um, than what we were looking at in October. Um, what you will see is the drop, expected drop in students from this year to next year is not as big as we were looking at in October. Um, two things, we've had a little bit more um, people moving into the district as this school year has gone on than we anticipated. And our kindergarten class looks like it's gonna be probably about 15 kids higher than we were expecting back in October, probably about five or six kids higher than it is this year. Um, and those, those are really the two things that are um, doing this. We've also made some very small um, assumptions of students being generated by the new development over on River Road. Um, all we have assumed at this point is that we'll add two, two students in the upcoming school year and eight additional students after that. It's 69 units of two bedroom apartments. Um, the last I talked with them, I know they are running behind schedule on construction, uh, I think because of the length of the winter. 
um, and they're mostly weather related. So they are not anticipating having anything done before the start of the school year. I think the earliest they're looking at now is the fall for having anything that is um, habitable at this point. Looking at the enrollment by building, um, you know, we've looked, it's been a little while since we've looked at this graph. Uh, they, again, as we're losing students, the high school is still getting bigger. Um, the high school is expected to peak out in the 16-17 school year, up around 875 students, um, still a little bit below the estimated capacity of the building. The elementary school, which has been losing students at a very sharp rate over the last few years, and will for a couple more, actually bottoms out in the 15-16 school year at about 500, you know, a little under 590 students. You can see by the end of the forecast period, the expectation is to recover by about 30 students. Um, that's because we have some historically small classes that are in there now by the end of the period. Those students will move down to the intermediate school and we're expecting the kindergarten classes coming in over the next few years to be bigger than the classes leaving at the end of third grade. The, correspondingly, the intermediate school is expected to drop enrollment sharply. Um, right now, we are just under 600 students that is expected to be under 490 by the end of the period as they have a couple historically large classes moving out and the historically small classes coming in to replace them. And then the, the middle school also will begin losing some students. They have one huge class right now that will be moving on to the high school. Actually, the eighth grade class this year is the largest class that we have um, in the district. That class obviously will be moving out, being replaced by smaller classes coming in behind it. Okay, it's enrollment. Moving on to the revenue overview, um, we are still getting, you know, expected to get by 2018, two thirds of the revenue in the district from the real property tax, um, about 22% from state aid, and then the rest, the small amounts from everything else. We are anticipating a, um, and a growth rate, which got caught up, cut off here at the bottom, can't really see it, it's 3.7% average annual growth rate over the forecast period. Um, that's mostly front loaded. The first two years, the percentages are higher. The last three years, the average is under 1% a year. And then again, as our, you know, that's why we're saying easily balanced for two years and then starting to look at our expenditures catching up with our revenues and then surpassing them at this point by the 17-18 school year as our revenues um, stagnate. The big jumps that we're getting right now, um, this year and next year, our state aid is going up you know, 10, over 10% 10 and then 8% next year. Um, the big jumps because of the new formula. Uh, obviously the real estate and personal property is because of the new levy, we're getting the large growth rates and those really flatten out um, after. The personal property, the public utility, that has actually been growing at a pretty good pace over the last um, four or five years. We're expecting three and a half percent going out. That may prove to be a little bit conservative, um, but I'm not real comfortable going much higher than that at this point because we have been getting some really large growth rates over the last couple of years. Uh, the property tax allocation is moving along with the um, real estate, that's the 10% rollback, the 2.5% rollback in the homestead exemption. You see the big drop in all other revenue in 15 and 16. That's the result of the um, candle tip ending. The tip has ended actually at the end of calendar year 13. We'll still get the payments in lieu of taxes this calendar year, and then those will stop that property becomes taxable as per real property after beginning in this year. And so, and right now the TIFs are the largest piece of the, of the other revenue. Uh, it, those, the TIF payments are providing about 20 or 25 percent of the revenue in that category. So obviously when those go away, we get some pretty big drops in the revenue there. Um, looking at the real property tax um, projections, you see the bump um, this year in 2014. 
the combination of the new levy and the additional money we've gotten in delinquencies. Normally we'd expect that bump to be about half the new levy, which is $2.3 million, but you, yeah, but you see it's actually going up almost 1.6. And that's because we got close to $400,000 of delinquency payments during fiscal year 14 that were above normal that we we're not counting on. Um, so we have the jump again in 15, and then we have a pretty much flattening out of revenues uh, beyond the effect of 15. The, there's a couple pieces of new construction that are in here. Um, obviously the TIF coming off at the end of last year. We have the new senior facility being uh, built over at South Cherry and Weaver Road. We're anticipating that coming on to the rolls in 2016 for payment in 2017. Um, and then we're anticipating about a 4% growth at the reappraisal in 2017, payable in 2018. Um, with luck, that may prove to be a little bit conservative as well. It looks like housing values are probably starting to come back, and we've seen some you know, some pretty good improvement in values over the last six months or so. Mm -hmm. um, state aid, if you take a look at our state share index, what we were looking at back in October and what we are looking at now, um, in the current fiscal year, it's a little bit higher, about eight tenths of a percent higher. That is primarily because of the change with the, how they're measuring the kindergarten students from what we thought they'd be doing back in October. Um, you do see a very, a pretty significant difference, though, in, 50, in the last three years of the forecast, where our state share index is two, almost two and a half points higher in the next, you know, the first two years, 16 and 17, and a little bit more than 18. And that's, their, that's primarily because of the additional students that we're anticipating picking up over the next couple of years from the beer and kindergarten classes and the development over on um, River Road. So those two items really are affect, you know, making us poorer as the new formula you know, allows. It makes us poor. So we have gotten a little bit better off in our state share index over the last three years, and you know, it doesn't look like a lot, but that's a significant. You know, really, each percentage point is worth probably about one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars of revenue. So you look at two and a half points. There, you're looking at the better part of three hundred thousand dollars of additional revenue um, by having that, that that additional state share index. Um, you take a look at the projected state aid. Um, our Valuation per pupil is getting bigger. Uh, part of the, you know, the drop that we have, you know, the, big, the drop that does happen here between 14-15 and 15-16 is a combination that we're losing, our, we're losing enrollment, so our you know, that makes us wealthier, and our values are going up a little bit, whereas the state's values are going down during the same period. State enrollment is not dropping as fast as we are. State enrollment drops between 0.3 and 0.5% a year. We're looking at a little more than percent a year, especially in the next year in our enrollment. So that, the, because we're now essentially getting wealthier at a faster rate than the state is, that makes us relatively wealthier, which is what drives the state share index down. Um, you do see the impact of the state share index going down. You know, we're peaking out in revenue here in 2015 at about $6.3 million. We're expecting that to drop down to about $6 million for the two years after that, and then another $100,000, $5.9 million um, the year after that. And again, if you remember what this looked like in October, this is a lot better than it looked in October when we were expecting to be down to probably in the neighborhood of $5.5 million by the 17-18 school year. And again, that's because of the higher state share index. And it says negative 0.6% overall state enrollment changes forecast? Or what the, was this? The state enrollment, if you look historically, the state enrollment and measured by ADM, average daily membership, drops between, between 0.3 and 0.5 percent a year. Okay. So about three tenths to five tenths of a percent a year. And that's what's built into the forecast, is that continued 
slow it drop. And of course, we, especially next year, you know, when we're expecting, we're expecting about a two or three percent drop because of that bit, the size of this year's senior class relative to next year's kindergarten class. And so what that'll do is then, that'll factor in when they recalculate everything in the 15, 16 school year, which is gonna shoot up and you see what it does between 15 and 16, our valuation per pupil goes from 170,000 to 176,000. Right. And at the same time, my forecast says the state valuation per pupil is going to decline slightly at, during the same period. Right. I know we've been hearing about this state population versus our local population and relative wealth and things like that, but it's just every time I see it, it drives home you know, how big these numbers can swing with little changes on enrollment, which you really mm -hmm. can't forecast so well, right? And, and now it's also the state level <clears throat> enrollment and population growth in general that and has huge swing and state, and, and state valuation, right? So there's yeah. so many things way outside of our control that are kind of impossible to forecast, right? That, yeah. that we really see huge impacts of here. Yeah. And I, it's isn't the first time we've heard it, right? But it's against, once again, a realization of it in terms of the numbers. And in this case, it's kind of to our favor, right? It looks like it's going to head in the right direction, right? Because of our enrollment forecasts are higher than we previously thought. Right. So right? essentially what's happened is our valuation per pupil in 16, 17, 8, and 18 is not as high as we were forecasting back in October, primarily right. because of our, our, our own enrollment has gotten bigger. Yeah because our, our student counts each year have gotten a little bit bigger. Yeah, yeah and it does, not, it does not take a lot of students to move these percentages right. um, by fairly you know, significant, relatively significant amounts. Yeah, so I'm not sure how that's gonna play out in overall state funding and district jockeying for students and how that all works, right? But it's such a big factor there. You would think there's gonna be ramifications of that as different districts yeah. find ways to take advantage of it or, or spin it. Yeah. Right, and obviously a lot of this is, you know, everything we're forecasting here from 16 through 18 is not in law right now. <laughs> There's that too, and right? And so, yeah, basically, we're trying to forecast what the legislature is going to do right. in the um, in the 15, 16 yeah. biennial budget. Right. And so, okay, you know, it's <laughs> it's an educated guess, but it is right. All kind of a, yeah. At this yeah. point, it's all kind of a guess. Yeah. Um, okay. I think it's better than not trying to take a guess, and I think it, right. I think that the assumptions that we're making are pretty solid assumptions at this yeah. point. Yeah, it's like each time we make assumptions, I think they're the best, and it's the best educated guess, and we're so far ahead of, of, of you know everybody else in the state in terms of our ability to make educated guesses, but still is moving around a lot. Yeah, it is, and there's still issues in here that aren't fully resolved. Yeah, um, yeah I told you about the, the issue with transportation funding which seems to be mostly resolved now, but I'm still not comfortable with the resolution of it. Um, that it's, I'm still not convinced it's 100% accurate yet um, and concerned that we may lose some money in transportation funding because of that. So uh, I, I kind of have a muted number in here for transportation until, mm -hmm. until the state, I guess, can assure us that yeah. All pieces of it are definitely working properly, yeah. and so that's yeah, you know, that's still out there. It, and again, it doesn't sound like a lot of money. Yeah, you know, but the change was about ninety. Yeah, you know, our our funding went up between the first and second April payments on an annual basis of about ninety two thousand dollars. Again, that doesn't sound like a lot in a twenty four million dollar budget. But when you get to the end five of years. the five-year forecasting period, it added about two hundred eighty thousand dollars onto yeah. our fund balance, mm -hmm. which was about you know seven percent seven percent increase in our fund balance, and that is a fairly significant mm -hmm. amount. Yeah, again, if you think of it in terms of property taxes, that's over half a mill. Mm -hmm. Just that one little that one little uncertainty, it, it's worth over half a mill of property taxes if it came to that. So. Mm -hmm. They're significant, it doesn't sound like a, not a lot, but when you build them up over time, it becomes a lot more significant. Yeah. I'm um, not gonna worry about the rest of the revenues, but yes, if those are two main. We'll take a look at our spending. We'll start with an overview. Um, this is updated data on our spending per pupil. This is now through the 2013 school year. 
This is comparing with what ODE recognizes as our four most similar districts. Again, Chagrin Falls, Highland Local in Medina County, Marymount and Canfield. Marymount's a suburb of Cincinnati, Canfield a suburb of Youngstown. Um, the big thing you see is that we have dropped now two years in a row, from, and especially last, between 12 and 13, from $10,200 a pupil down to $9,364 a pupil. That's because of the big reductions that we made prior to the 12-13 school year and the million and a half, you know, the million to million and a half dollars of effective cuts that we had in the budget that year. Um, you see that leaves us below um, the average for the among the five districts. The statewide average is about 10,002 or three, so we're well below the statewide average as well. You see in our comparison districts, we're well below two or a little above the other two. Hmm. Taking a look at our overall spending, um, again, not surprisingly, most of our money is going to salaries and benefits. The, the other things are all pretty small in, in comparison. The average, the average projection in salaries over the next five years is about 2.3% annual, average annual growth compared to about 2.2% over the previous five years. So pretty similar. Um, our our uh, benefits, unfortunately, about 8.3% compared to about 2.4%. Again, that 2.4% was heavily influenced by the year of the reductions, both because we had a lot of people we were not paying health insurance, plus we happened to have great utilization at the same time. And so not only did we were paying for fewer, fewer people, we had a 4.5% drop in our um, premium cost the one year. We're not anticipating that happening again um, during, the, during the upcoming period. Of, our utilization has not been very good um, over the last year or so, and at this point, we're not forecasting it being very, that good going on. Um, nothing else really standing out. You see the big drops in our all other expenditures in 14 and 15, and that's going back here in the, in the saga of where we were paying for our operations director. Remember, it was at the ESC last year before it came back to us, and that's what's that's the biggest piece of that, of that spending was when we had to move the spending over to the ESC and then back again. Um, and so, yeah, really, if you look at our salaries overall this year, our salary spending was only up a quarter of a percent over the last year. The, the, the jump for next year is a little bit artificially um, inflated, the 5% jump. Part of that is because of the refilling of the operations director. Part of that will be because of the anticipated overlap we'll have at the elementary school for half a year in the administration. Um, we've added the global studies and English position at the high school because of our class sizes. So, the, so that's a little bit inflated. It's not just the, the agreement with the GEA that's causing that jump. You see the last three years when that's more, you know, even around 2% or just under 2% is despite the, you know, with or including the effects of the um, negotiated agreement. Taking a look at salaries, um, obviously you have the big drop in 2013, the 6% drop from the, you know, the reductions that we made and the fact that the um, our teachers and our other staff members had zero base and zero step in that year as well. So there were no no raises of any kind and plus we had a six or seven percent drop in our overall staffing levels so we got the big drop. Again you see the bump in fifteen and then the flattening out through the last three years of the forecast. Taking a look at the benefits, and if you look at the tannish area up above, um, you'll see in the year we're in right now, our healthcare benefits actually grew over 17% this year. Again, primarily because of combination of utilization, plus we have about 4% additional fees because of the Affordable Care Act that are new in this, in this um, 
fiscal year that's, at, that's contributing about a quarter of the growth are those additional fees. Because of the concessions um, that we had as part of the negotiations, next year we are expecting an 8.7% increase. Remember when we were doing this back in October, we were expecting maybe a 25% increase because of our utilization. Some of the early numbers we had was going to be a 32% increase because our utilization got even worse. Um, we went through the bidding and negotiating process. We are able to get that down to 8.7%, which is a pretty significant savings there. Um, we are, based on the second year bids that we got and our utilization rates, unfortunately, we're still looking at a pretty hefty increase next year unless our utilization rates got a lot better. We don't really have the option of going out and bidding, rebidding the insurance again next year. If you start rebidding that every year, people are going to stop bidding on it because it's they can't, yeah, they're not going to have a chance to adjust to you know, activity. And then the last two years, the um, I'm just are just at industry trend at this point. And the staffing levels that are assumed throughout the forecast period are commensurate with the enrollment, so we're going to have similar levels of student-to-teacher ratio and adjustments as needed between levels as these bubble yeah. classes go and through and so forth. Basically what we have in here, we're anticipating a reduction of one teacher position a year each year through the forecast as we're adjusting to our enrollment, um, and the health insurance reflects the same thing. Now, what I tend to do, and it, it caught you know, to be on the conservative side is when I assume we're losing teachers due to retirement, if we're going to be replacing them, I'm assuming we're losing someone taking family coverage, or yeah, no, losing someone taking single coverage and replacing it with someone taking family coverage. That's right, um, okay. And so that probably has the effect of overinflating by a little bit, um, mm -hmm. but it's, a, it's just a, a little bit more of a safe assumption going forward. Sure. And the same is what if I'm assuming we're just losing a position, I'm assuming we're losing at a single coverage rate, not a family coverage rate. Okay. Um, the last piece, and this is something we normally would not um, be highlighting, but I do want to highlight it because it is something that we'll be voting on the five-year forecast and then the appropriation next month, is you see under 2015, there's a transfer out of $188,000. Um, what that is coming from is that is a proposed transfer to two different places. It's being funded, remember earlier I mentioned we got about $375,000 of delinquency money we are not anticipating this year. Um, what Jeff and I are proposing is that we take half of that, so about $188,000, and use it for one time, some one-time things that we need to do. One of those comes from the food service account. The last three years, we have been running ba on balance. We've been taking in what we have been spending. But the first year of the current of the current contract, we actually had about a twenty or twenty-five thousand dollar loss, and it's sort of been <coughs> rolled forward each year by the accounting practice that have been in use since then. And so, basically, what we're doing is saying that um, we're going to take, which we think will be twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars that we'll need move that to the food service account to, so essentially at the end of this school year, we make whole yeah, and get us back on balance. You know, we're going through the bid process right now on the food service. Obviously, if we choose to change vendors, we're going to have to do that and make ABI whole you know, if they have to change. Even if we don't change vendors, we still want to get, get us back in a place where we're bringing in spending the same amount every year rather than rolling this continual deficit forward the same amount. The rest of the money, we are, project, we are requesting to go to some very high need projects um, in the capital, within our capital budget, because despite the renewal of the levy, there's still more demands on the revenue than we have revenue. Um, the couple things we are proposing, the dormers over the tech room in the high school, um, probably with nice waterfalls in there over the weekend and yesterday. And that's kind of high-priced equipment in there. And so we've got to get the dormers fixed so that that building is not leaking. Um, you know, we know everyone's aware of the problems we had at GIS 
with the break-ins. Uh, we're putting security cameras out at GIS um, to help monitor and hopefully prevent that from happening in the future. Um, we're going to talk about running fiber optic lines between GES, at the elementary and the high school. What that'll do is that we'll own the lines. Right now we lease them from Time Warner Cable. We'll increase the capacity by how much, Rob? From 110,000. Okay, so by 1,000 times. We'll be increasing the capacity by 1,000 times. And that will actually pay for itself within, what, about two and a half years? Right. In the savings from not having to lease it from Time Warner. Um, all of the AEDs in the district are functioning but not serviceable. Um, so if anything goes wrong with them, they cannot be fixed. And so what we are proposing is replacing all the AEDs. We'll probably need somewhere between eight and 10. I've been talking with Chief Hossi as, yeah, first of all, we wanna get something that is compatible with the AEDs that they are running at the firehouse um, so that if they have to come into an emergency situation, they can just plug theirs directly into, you know, if we've already begun using them, so it's a seamless transition, and also because it helps with the serviceability, you know, if they're running. And so I've talked, we've I've had some conversations with them about where they need to go. Um, that's why it's between eight and ten, because the the standard is you should have one within that ninety seconds that you can get to and back within ninety seconds, and so. Yeah, there may be one or two more that we, right now I think we have eight across the, our, our four buildings, or five buildings, and we may need one or two more to meet that, that, that um, criteria. And then the last piece is, if we have the revenue to do so, is to also then start putting security cameras in the high school as well, um, again, for safety purposes. So that's the use of the $188,000 that we are requesting to come out of the operating budget into the you know, capital and food service budgets to, to do that. We are going to emphasize we are taking one-time money and we are doing one-time expenditures with it. We are not building in any kind of long-term disequilibrium into the five-year forecast by spending one-time money on an ongoing expense. And with the passage of our recent PI levy, though, the, what's the justification for not pulling some out of there instead? Basically, the justification is we have more demand for that money than we have money. Um, yeah, we're fully, we're still working on, yeah, on paring down the requests we have right now for in, in our five-year plan, you know, and for seeing what we can and can't do within the PI levy, the or Granville, Community authority mm -hmm. money and the um, the capital maintenance levy, but you know, we generate about a million from a million fifty thousand to one point one million a year in there, and our demands are generally running between one point two and one point three million a year for what we'd like you know, to do this, the projects we need to keep the buildings operating and you know things like heating. Mm -hmm. so that we can actually keep them warm in the winter and, and things like that so we've had that's some justification. we've had some other issues crop up yeah. like at the back of the elementary there's an erosion issue that is a byproduct of the heavy rains that we experienced and and some of the routing of the the creek at mm -hmm. the upper level so we've had some areas there that are going to require some significant um, erosion okay. control measures okay but you know, things like that happen and so we have to be willing and able to correct them quickly. Yeah, and we have, we have roof we have roof issues we have to deal with with both the elementary and intermediate school. We need to replace an 84 passenger bus. So it, those are all expensive propositions in the scheme of what we have available to us. Luckily, we will be opening up some money next year because the the four year loan from the bond fund, the PI fund from the energy project, this year is the last year of repayment. So that's two hundred twenty-five thousand dollars a year that we don't have to just repay the bond fund for anymore. So that helps us out some, as far as, but still not enough to get us through the, you know, the demands we have on the on the money. Um, summary. 
they said we're going to be running close to you know, surpluses the next couple of years. I'm anticipating for the 16, 17 year, we will also be in surplus once we get there. Um, 17, 18, we've got some work to do. We'll start working on at the end of this year. We should have an excess of three and a half billion dollars in cash at the end of the five year period. Again, that's good. Um, as I said, no anticipation of need for it being on the ballot again over the five year forecast period. The two major risks that we have to the formula, um, obviously as we talked a little bit ago, we don't know what the state funding formula is going to be after next year. Yeah, there's a 2% base increase in per pupil. I don't know if that's a good assumption or not. Um, and obviously, yeah, the guaranteed discussion that we've been having for the last year and a half now, I think, um, what the guarantee is going to be. Um, obviously, that's a big, you know, where I think it's going to be is what's built into the, um, to the current forecast. Really, the only risk with that is positive. Yeah. Because if the guarantee gets worse, it doesn't affect us because we're not on the guarantee. If the guarantee is better, that helps us because then we would be on a new guarantee since we're going to be expecting to lose revenue between next year and the year after. So the guarantee can only help us in that case. And of course, healthcare premiums, you know, that's always a, a risk. We get you know, a lot, so much is driven by utilization at this point. I think where I've got the forecast right, right now, I think it's a balanced risk. Um, I think. It's just as likely that we'll be do better than we have forecast and worse. Um, but it is obviously a risk because it doesn't take a lot for those percentages to change very rapidly by large in large increments. So those are the risks of the forecast. Questions? Okay. Or questions? We will be voting on the forecast in the financial part so that I can go ahead and get it submitted to the state by the end of the month. This five-year forecast actually looks like the five-year forecast when I was applied for this job three years ago. Um, <laughs> and then shortly afterwards, uh, there was a significant cut in state aid, and we've been adjusting ever since. So I'm glad to see a, uh, a positive outlook financially for us, knowing that we are committed to, I think you heard from the Denison students and from um, Mr. Sobel that we continue to um, operate and look for ways to do things more efficiently and that's at every level of the organization and we're going to continue to try and provide the best possible education to students in a way that is fiscally responsible to our taxpayers and we're committed to that but it is nice to see a cash balance that's a little bit north of two million um, so that's that's a good thing so we tested your faith for a little you did test my faith, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't I think our we're, fault. No, no, and it wasn't mine. No, it wasn't your fault. <laughs> again, you got that, no, Chuck? But, yeah. <laughs> no, but again, it was again a change in what was happening at the state level over which we had no control. So um, correct. I did, but I wasn't working here at the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a good thing we've got him on our team now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes. Any other questions? No, I, I think it's a very thorough document um, and hopefully a good roadmap that, uh, yeah. you know, barring any significant changes in state aid um, you know, or huge swings in some of our expenses, primarily insurance, uh, I think we are in fairly solid footing thanks to the voters in the community and the collaboration from um, folks at the GEA and the teaching staff. We've been able to make some choices and, and uh, position the district for uh, what hopefully is a uh, an uneventful few years, at least economically. Uh, and I appreciate it. But thanks for the detail. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think it's also important to note that at our last work <coughs> session we talked about the longer term economic sustainability conversation that Granville is talking about and our role in that conversation. And I think that's something to start now when we do have a really good financial picture in front of us so that we work towards uh, a greater solution long term. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. Thanks, Mike.
Thank you. Um, at this time, we'd like to um, entertain public comments. If you would like to address the board, please. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> please come to the podium and state your name and address and speak for up to three to five minutes. Is there anybody who'd like to address the board, address the board at this time? our gratitude uh, for your continued support and your, um, I guess, willingness to do that on our behalf. And it looks as though hopefully all of the ballot language will make it very clear to all the voters that this isn't another mill that you guys are putting on or anything like that, that this is indeed um, for the public body. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, would anybody else like to address the board at this time? Being not, we'll move on uh, to board reports. Okay. We have a collection this evening. Yep. Um, and uh, barring any problems with the book count, <laughs> <laughs> we will have three. I don't even have to use the second hand. <laughs> we will have three new trustees joining, or three trustees, two are new. One is, one one is new, two are to our um, incumbents. Okay. And uh, we are meeting then the 22nd? 22nd. Of May for our um, first meeting after the election. Thomas? Um, for the GF, did I explain the, the, the proposals we got specifically last month? I want to just mention, mention them. I don't, the meeting is this Wednesday evening, so I'm not sure if they've officially been approved by the board, but I'm going to mention the four grant proposals that we received because they're all just fantastic, and I know that the GEF is working really hard, not just themselves to find the funds to, to make them work, but also with other partner organizations. Um, uh, first one I'm going to mention is called a Practical Application of Modern Tools which is for purchase of a 3D printer and robots. And this is just a fantastic thing. You can actually use a 3D printer to make pieces of robots, right? And this is gonna be coordinated by Rob Sexton and probably rolled out through the STAR uh, community. And there's already been a great model there that's happened at the intermediate school. But this is just a really cool way to bring some very next generation technology into those kids that are excited about that. Also great that it's not just a direct staff member that they're looking to fund, but somebody in our support organization um, there's lots of opportunities there. Uh, the next second grant was a building STEM brick by brick, which is a proposal by the elementary school advanced learner program to purchase Legos for animated stories, right? So they're going to use bricks to basically build animated technical stories and, and do some, I think, both creative writing elements as well as creative elements in addition to the technical side. So it was a, it's a really cool combination that way. There's a proposal by, uh, to install a solar panel at the high school, which is actually a proposal started by a student and supported by staff. And uh, that's another fantastic one that's really dri driven at not only sustainable energy and having energy for a greenhouse, but driving that back into the curriculum as well. And then the fourth proposal was um, for district art panels, which I think is going to be co-founded by another support organization to find a way to showcase some of our um, artwork that the students do in a uniform way through the buildings, right? And find a way so that's protected and so it's uh, clearly set aside. 
But those are the four proposals that were received, and I expect that the GEF will work really hard and hopefully approve this week uh, funding of those along with some other support organizations. There might have been some extra information they needed to receive, but they were all just fantastic grants, and there's lots more to come and lots more opportunity by uh, working with the GEF. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> we, we get to edit the loving committee's resting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, just I know you know, uh, we all uh, express a great deal of thanks to Jay Snyder and um, the countless volunteers who helped with the levy campaign. It was a great effort. Uh, I'm sure that Beth Halpin can help put our kids back in our car since it's no longer full of yard signs. <laughs> <laughs> Mary Geyer um, obviously is our communications person, but after hours, she did a ton of work um, on the levy and working on the website and getting communications with, from the committee out to um, the right avenues. So she did a fantastic job, and that's all stuff that we don't pay her for. Um, and uh, she, as a community resident, that dedicated her time. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Um, legislation, um, not a whole lot is new. Um, we're still, uh, yeah, it's the House relative Bill. Relatively speaking. Relative yeah. speaking. <laughs> uh, not from what I reported on last time. So, um, yeah. House Bill 487 is the, um, there's several things going on there, but the thing that we're keeping the closest eye on is the, um, um, uh, the college, college credit, credit plus, plus um, and whether or not that's going to, how it's going to get funded. Um, not whether it sh no, those things should happen, but how, how it's going to be funded. And um, so it's currently in the Senate Education Committee, um, and they're expected to continue to hold hearings um, through next week um, before making any amendments or any changes. Um, I don't know if you, this is, this is the updates that I've gotten from, the, um, from OSBA. I don't know if you have any other I questions. have my legislative meeting this week. Okay, so you so haven't got anything Wednesday. else to um, So that's the other one. The other um, big one that we're looking at is um, um, the, um, substitute um, Senate Bill 229, which is the OTES um, changes. Um, the Senate had done um, quite a few things to make it more flexible for us um, in how we apply OTES, um, and then the House has turned around and added 32 new provisions to the original proposal. Um, and so um, they're still debating it, and it hasn't really gone anywhere yet, but um, their changes have take it away all that flexibility that the Senate had put in. So they're really far apart at this point, and I think we had mentioned last time that we don't think that um, we're really going to have a resolution on that before the end of the school year. So um, it's hard to say what that's going to do for us next year. Um, currently in our policy, we adopted for the provision that said that if a teacher is rated accomplished, we could evaluate them every other year. And so we will have that flexibility built into our current policy. That legislation was going to give us even greater latitude. Okay. Um, remember, we hired an additional administrator to split between the elementary and intermediate just because of that legislation. So again, um, I know that the General Assembly talks about trying to uh, limit the barriers that they put in front of us, but that's one of those policies that really did impact us financially. But I have to say, that the evaluation system has been an overwhelming success from the standpoint of talking about best practices in the classroom and that relationship between the administration and the teachers um, I think is critical and that professional dialogue is is absolutely critical moving forward. Right, and that's that's reflected in the agreement that we have to kind of create the framework, framework for how Granville is going to deal with these in the future, right? So I think that's a huge step forward that's reflected. That's the most important part is working here locally, right, and staying close and open about that. And hopefully the state will figure out their mind, make up their mind at some point. Hopefully. <laughs> that's right. um, it's uh, at CTEC. There's lots of things, you know, competitions and um, awards happening. Their um, honors um, ceremony is the 23rd, which is a week from Friday. 
Um, and after that is usually when we get a lot of updates in terms of what students are moving on to. So I'll update more in June, but um, just a few highlights from what's happening there. Um, 10 members of the uh, senior class received um, high schools that work award of educational achievement. Um, and in order to do that, they had to take um, um, college preparatory courses um, of study in at least two of three subject areas, um, English, language, arts, math, or science. Um, they had to complete a concentration in the career techni technical area, um, mathematics, science, or the humanities. Um, and they had to meet uh, readiness goals in three subject areas, um, reading, math, and science. Um, so they had to take a pretty tough course load in order to um, be to gain that recognition. And 10 of our students this year um, received that recognition. Um, we had one student who, um, who was in the electrical trades um, um, department, and um, she's from Lakewood, but um, she was one um, of 15 seniors who uh, received um, a top award from the Ohio Department of Education. Um, one um, award was given for each field, um, and um, a CTEC student won the, um, got the one for um, the electrical trades, so that's, kind of, that's exciting. Yeah. Um, about 100 nominations were received and 15 awards were given. So those are just a couple of highlights of, of things happening um, awards-wise um, at CTEC. Thank you. Yep. And with that, um, we will move on to the action agenda. Action agenda. Excellent. Uh, item 9.01 is the um, approval of the resolution for membership for the OHSAA, which is our annual renewal. So moved. Sorry, no. Questions or comments? Take a vote, please. Mr. Miller? Aye. Dr. Rentel? Aye. Mr. Janice? Aye. Ms. Deeds? Aye. Dr. Horman? Aye. Next is item 9.02, overnight field trips. We have two. Uh, the first one is our high school drama club and choir are traveling to New York City next year. Um, it's hard to believe that we're approving things for the fall, but we're here. So um, that's the first one. And then uh, Cindy Schaefer and one of our students are going to San Antonio for the National FCCLA competition this summer. So both of those are overnight field trips. Show me. Okay. Questions or comments? Was that Amy? Amy, okay. You can take your off. Um, Ms. Deeds. Aye. Dr. Rentel. Aye. Mr. Janice. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Thank you. So I'm going to amend that and make sure that <laughs> Ms. Otter is also named as a person that's taking. And it's Debbie Bagley that's going okay. to be paying our money. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Barb. So can we just make a motion yes. to approve as amended? As amended, yes. Yeah. Okay, so moved. So moved. Second. All right. <laughs> Um, Ms. Deeds. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Dr. Rentel. Aye. Ms. G Mr. Janice. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. 9.03 is unpaid leave of absences. We have three requests. So, moved. second. Any questions? Take the roll. Mr. Janice. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Dr. Rentel. Aye. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. We have one maternity leave. Of the birth of a child in July um, for Namar Tuts and Art Roberts now. <laughs> Second. Do we, um, will she be replaced for the? Yeah, the we have a long term sub for her replacement. Okay. Thanks. Take a vote, please. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Mr. Janice. Aye. Dr. Rentel. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. This is a nice action item. Yeah. Approve the 2013-14 graduates of Granville High School. So I would like to give the honor to uh, Mr. Janice to <laughs> make motion. Should I check with the principal first? <laughs> <laughs> so moved. It's my favorite motion of the year, I have yeah. to say. It's the best part of the job. Just remember graduation Sunday, June 1st at the Mitchell Center. 
Congratulations to all the graduating seniors. Mr. Janice. Aye. Dr. Rentel. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Okay, the next item is 9.06, and it's for the uh, Granville Intermediate School Wetlands Project. And I can talk a little bit more about that. So moved. Second. Right. You said second. Kate. 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 Okay. Uh, as you know, that we received a grant for um, roughly $30,000 from the U.S. Uh, Fish and Wildlife Service to create the habitat in front of the Granville Intermediate School. And um, in order to create the wetlands, we have to break the tiles that are underneath the um, current topography so that we can create those natural wetlands. And so this is um, for the ex excavating company to do that work. Oh, we did that. We did Sorry. that. Any yeah. questions? <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, and is this part of the existing um, grant? I mean, coming out of our existing. Yeah. No, the, this is actually in the, new the next one. The next motion will be to amend the original grant right. for additional $22,500. And this will be coming actually out okay. of the second part of it. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. That can happen this summer? Yes. It, yeah, maybe not even, they may even start during May, in the next couple of weeks. They may create the wetlands just <laughs> with the rain that we've been yeah, having. Right. Exactly. But, this is a little side, how did the trees survive? Uh, they're doing, we, we had to upright all of the plastic tubing, um, so we did that a couple of weeks ago. Not we, I did not do it, um, a bunch of volunteers did it, but uh, they did pretty well. Yeah, Brent said they all came through the winter okay. Yeah. And, and I trust we're in collaboration with the farmer that farms the neighboring land because I know he had some specific questions and concerns about water flow and drainage, and he's an intimate part of it. That's correct. Great. Okay. Take a roll. Okay. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Dr. Rantel. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Mr. Janice. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. The next item, 9.07, as Mr. Sobel alluded, we have to amend the original agreement with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to increase the allocation of money. So moved. And this, you remember the original allocation was $25,000. Um, this will take the allocation up to $47,500 that the Fish and Wildlife Service has put into this. Um, I will probably be coming for an appropriation adjustment next month. I think we only appropriated $45,000 for the project this year, so we're going to run over that by $1,500 or, or $2,500. So that'll that'll be on the agenda next month. Okay. Any questions? Ms. Deeds. Aye. Mr. Janice. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Dr. Rentel. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Next item is 9.08, the athletic handbook approval for the 2014-15 school year. Second, should I yeah. make, okay, so um, I would propose that we make one minor uh, amendment to the handbook before we approve it, and, and I should have printed it out to bring it with me and neglected to do so. But page four has a specific provision in, um, that says it's the policy of the district to um, take all actions to prevent any verbal abuse or, or other abuse of participants in extracurricular activities, coaches, uh, or officials, and my proposed amendment would be that we also include spectators in that so that we uh, be consistent with what we consider to be uh, good sportsmanship and fair play and treat spectators with respect. And we agree with that. So Great. as amended, I don't know, does that require a second motion now? No. no. Dr. Rentel, Aye. Mr. Janice, Aye. Ms. Deeds, Aye. Mr. Miller, Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Thank you. 9.09 .09 is the annual LACA service agreement for the 14-15 school year. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more once we have the motion. So moved. Second. As you know, LACA is our ITC, so they handle most of our technology um, 
flow through process, I guess is the best way to say it. Um, they're a function of the state, but um, we utilize them to provide um, technology services to the district. The good news is, is we are going to experience a 5% decline in this contract um, over the next year because they brought on Medina City Schools as a large school district, which lowered the cost for the rest of the um, current users. So that's a good thing for us, and it really didn't impact our service level, which is another positive. It seems like sometimes in the past we've been, we debated whether we bring things internal that have been previously outsourced there. Is that process ongoing or are we continuing with That's the same level of, of services or is that? ESC as opposed to LACA. Okay. Um, we do have a lot of internal metrics, like we host our own um, email system right. where a lot of people contract with LACA for that. Um, is that saving us money? What's that? Does that save us money? It then? does save us money. Okay. And Rob has done a great job of yeah. building an infrastructure that is cost effective for us with minimal utilization of lack as extra services. Yeah. I know there's been a great, a lot of great work bringing things internal and having better control over some elements of our technology <coughs> program, and I'm hopeful that they're kind of reflected in the economics and the better deal we can get from whatever. Yeah. It's basically the main line out to the, the internet, and that's what we're paying the majority of our cost for. And the whole accounting system. And the, and the yeah. whole accounting system. And the accounting system. system. I forgot <laughs> to mention uh. his world. <laughs> okay. No, that's a big piece. Yeah. Huh. Any other questions? We, we've also made changes. Right? Hmm? Okay. Hmm. Yeah. You take a roll? Mr. Janice. Aye. Dr. Rentel. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Dr. Kuhnman. Aye. Next item, 10.5. Or 9.0, 9.10. Just my glasses. Yes, actually, <laughs> I would at this point. I'd like to recommend the Director of Student Services position. So moved. Second. And I'd like to have Gwen Spence stand up at this time. Gwen is. Thank you. Thank you. Gwen is coming to us from Southwestern City Schools and uh, has a wealth of experience in this seat of Director of Student Services. We're very excited to have her um, join our team and as we said before, we're very sad to see Ms. Pariso go, but um, you know, we're, we're constantly growing and changing and so um, we're glad to have Gwen join our team. I'm looking forward to being part of the team as well. Thank you, Gwen. Welcome to the district. Take a roll, please. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Mr. Janice. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Dr. Rentel. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Thank you. The next item is another person sitting in the audience, the Director of Human Resources and Operations position. So moved. Second. Okay. I'd like to introduce Tanya Sherburn, who is going to be our new Director of Human Resources and Operations. She is currently the superintendent of New Lexington City Schools. And uh, Tanya and I actually did some work together. She spent some time with us upstairs a couple of years ago on the Employee Code of Conduct. Um, nice. And we worked together on that project. And so we're very glad to see her join our team and we're looking forward to great things from her as well. As you can tell from our energy policy conversation, yes. you have some work to do. <laughs> so. Very exciting, thank you. All right. Welcome. So, so moved? Did it's we do that yet? Okay. Okay. We already Sorry. Did credit, yeah. All right. <laughs> Go ahead. Sure. You can take the roll, please. Mr. Janice. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Dr. Rentel. Aye. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. I want to thank both of them because we did put them through an exhaustive search process. And between Kathy and I, we, we coordinated those two sort of searches and went through quite a few interviews. So, And I want to thank Kathy for her help yeah. in selecting um, Tanya. So. Next item takes a little explanation as well. So um, it's the 9.12, which is um, the approval of the assistant superintendent. So, so moved. Second. Second. So close. I will second it. <laughs> um, we are not hiring another assistant superintendent. Um, there is an action item in the consent agenda 
that has to do with Dr. Fry, who is resigning, and I will talk a little bit about that in the consent agenda. Um, but typically, when we have a vacancy that occurs, um, especially at a high-level position, um, we would post the position, do a search, and select the person that we believe is the best candidate. Um, in this case, Mr. Bernath, our high school principal, has demonstrated his competence over the last several years in his leadership of Granville High School. I don't think anybody can debate um, his passion for the job, his collaborative skills with students, staff, and parents, and his instructional leadership skills. And um, therefore, I want Ryan to be the next um, assistant superintendent and to lead our continuous improvement process that Dr. Fry really um, jump-started through his tenure in Granville Schools. So um, that's my little sound bite for you. You got that, Chuck? <laughs> I can. <laughs> <laughs> High school's loss actually is the district's gain, and um, I agree with that. Mr. Bernath has done phenomenal things at high school, and I am looking forward to watching him share those talents with the uh, with the other buildings. I'm excited about that. Dr. Rantel. Sorry, what? Did I write the wrong thing down? She, Amy, uh, Amy moved. Oh. Uh, my hearing is like gone. <laughs> Sorry. It's that five year forecast that yeah. <laughs> Ms. Deeds. Aye. Mr. Janice. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Dr. Rentel. Yes. <laughs> Dr. Gorman, sorry about that. I, I guess I really need to get it, that it, hearing. Yes. Yes. I? I'll, yes. Yes. Did, no, you, they did say it at the exact same time. It was stereo, so yes. it okay. like it was me. No, no, no. Does that invalidate the action? No, yeah. not at all. <laughs> uh, obviously, with that action item. That Can I just being... say congratulations, oh. Ryan? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I was already moving on. So. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, action item 9.13 is the appointment of the interim high school principal. And after a motion, I'll talk about that. So moved. Second. Got it. You got it? All right. Very good. Uh, obviously, with uh, Ryan's promotion, that leaves a vacancy in the high school principal position. And uh, Mr. Durst is going to be placed as the interim. Um, obviously, due to timing, it's not ideal to run a high school principal search in May or even into June. Uh, because they are very busy at this time of the year. And so um, Mr. Durst is going to assume the interim position for a year, and we plan on posting that position in the spring of 2015 and run a search at that time. And um, he will provide us consistency and leadership in that building and look forward to great things from him in the future as well. So um, I know that there is that was quite a few new hires and dominoes that have fallen, but I am very excited about all the um, opportunities that they present. Nice job in pushing through all of this work that you had to do to do all this. I'm glad you feel informed. <laughs> <laughs> Take the roll, please. Mr. Miller. Aye. Dr. Rentel. Aye. Mr. Janice. Aye. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Excellent. Next is the consent agenda for item 10.01 A through C. Nine. <laughs> C9. And with one amendment, there is a mistake on item seven. The head group, golf girls is actually group two. 
not group one. So just make that note for yourselves that the head golf girls position with Jim Greenwood is a group two. <laughs> All right, I'd like to highlight a couple of things for you. On, um, first of all, we received quite a bit of computer equipment from State Farm to, as donations to the Granville School Districts. Um, we won't talk about what they are or how much it is, but it's, it's great equipment that they have donated to us, and, and I know that um, Mr. Sexton's probably very happy because it would have um, been a significant expenditure had we, um, had we had to go out and purchase them ourselves. So we appreciate State Farm's partnership with Granville Schools. Um, I'd like to identify the certified staff that we're hiring. Um, we have a 7th, 8th grade middle school social studies teacher that is the replacement for a retirement and um, a high school social studies English language arts teacher. Um, remember that is the position that is an additional position due to the addition of the Global Ed Scholars Program and the increased need for additional English support. Um, we also have all of our certified and classified contract renewals. That is our annual renewal process. So you see our one year, two year, three year and continuing contracts um, and the classified contract renewals that are stipulated by contract. Um, I'd also call your attention to the supplementals that will be um, in the fall. And finally, the resignations that we will accept with appreciation of their service to Granville Schools. Rita Baldwin, who is our, our current Spanish teacher and Global Language Department Chair. Greg Griffith, who is a bus driver. Stephanie Flair, who is our advanced learner teacher at the elementary. Um, and Dr. Fry, as mentioned earlier, obviously, um, you know, big shoes to fill. And, um, you know, I've, I've worked with Tom for about 10 years now. And um, I'm certainly going to miss our professional relationship. I know our personal relationship will endure. But um, he's added a ton of value to Granville Schools. And I know he didn't want me to say anything, and I have never listened to him. So <laughs> um, I'm talking about him no matter what. So, um, but all of the resignations, either for the purpose of retirement or moves, um, you know, it's with appreciation of service. I second the comments about all that Tom has contributed. I hope there's ways that he can continue to keep in touch with him in his future career, us in future career, because I'm sure there's lots of ways that we can continue to use his insights. And there's a great succession plan in place there, so that's fantastic. Um, relative to the elementary school advanced learner position, yes. the Mrs. Flair moved. Right. And yeah, so and so we, we will be we posting will that. Post that tomorrow. Fantastic. Yep. And we have a wonderful sub in that environment right now. Absolutely. And, uh, but we have to go through the collective bargaining process for posting that position. Thank you again, Tom, for all that you've done. Thank you. Uh, Teacher Roll, please. Dr. Rantel. Aye. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Mr. Janice. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. This brings us to the financial portion of the meeting. Um, it should be a very short. <laughs> uh, first will be the adoption of the April um, budget highlights. Um, I will just give a very, very, sorry, very, you heard enough of me tonight. Um, actually, it was a very slow month in April. Revenues were, did pretty much what we expected them to do. Expenditures did pretty much what we expected them to do. Um, we're right on track with our, you know, where we expect to be at the end of the year. Um, I did. I threw in the expenditure graph at the end. You'll see where, where we should be when we're ten months through the year, as far as the percentages that we have spent through the year. 
um, should be able to get through the year fine without any uh, any major issues. You know, all the big stuff you've heard already in my presentation. That's short enough for you? Yes, that was excellent. <laughs> Best presentation I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone have any questions? questions? Okay. Mr. Janice, Aye. Ms. Deeds, Aye. Dr. Rentel, Aye. Mr. Miller, Aye. Dr. Kornman, Aye. thank you. Next is the adoption of the five-year forecast. Um, you heard the presentation. Everyone should have gotten a copy of the forecast. Um, I do still have to write the narrative to go along with it, which I will do and send to everybody before I submit it to the state. Um, I will probably follow a lot of the patterns um, that you saw in the presentation in putting together the narrative to go with the forecast. I'll be doing that over the next week or so so that I can submit it probably next week. So it's due by the end of the month? Do by the end of the month. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Dr. Rentel. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Mr. Janice. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Eleven point oh three to transfer funds. This is this will be a longer I this will be a longer presentation than my than my month the other two combined were. Not that I don't mean the one earlier. <laughs> the last two. Last Sounds like a threat. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That was okay. Amy. Yeah. They gotta look at me when they do that. I started, so you weren't listening. <laughs> <laughs> um, what we're doing here, um, if you remember back in 2007, for those of you who were on the board, I think it was none of you, was it? Um, okay. At that time. Um, in advance of the bond proposal that went on to the ballot to build a fifth building, the operating fund advanced the capital fund $700,000 for site work and architectural work for the new building. That money was spent prior to the vote on the levy. When the levy failed, the money had already been spent and there was no way for it to be repaid back to the operating fund from the bond fund, or the capital fund rather. We have been carrying that on our books now for seven years as a receivable into the operating, operating fund. From a practical standpoint, there is zero chance that that is ever going to be repaid because I have tried everything I could with working with legal counsel to figure out if there was a legal way to do it. There was not. Um, the only way it can get repaid is if at some time in the future, we were to do a capital project funded by bonds again. And as part of the scope of that project, we would have to build in collecting an extra $700,000 from taxpayers to repay the advance from 2007. I think from a practical standpoint, that would be a very foolish thing to do, to ask the taxpayers to pony up $700,000 so we could pay ourselves back. And so after working with both and conversations with both the state auditor's office and legal counsel, um, what this recommendation will do is change the nature retroactively of what was done by the board in 2007, changing it from an advance to essentially a grant of money. Um, what that will do is essentially allow us to write that off the books which if we were a private company, we probably would have done four or five years ago because we're not carrying receivables that far and we will not have to carry that in the CAFR every year going forward until forever, I guess. Um, and so that's the nature of the transaction um, that we're asking you to approve tonight. Questions? Simply an acknowledgement in the books and records that the money was spent in 2007 and, and is not going to be repaid. Yeah, essentially, we're, we're just, it's essentially right, you know, if you think of it in the terms, right. it's essentially writing off a bad debt is essentially what it is, an uncollectible bad debt. Okay. And so what's, in that implications of that are within the five-year forecast? No, the implications are actually, only... the implications are actually zero. 
All it's all it is going to do is take the receivable off the book, so that when we do the CAFR at the end of this year, we are not carrying that seven hundred thousand right. dollars as a liability in the capital fund and a risk and a potential revenue right. to the operating budget because it's an acknowledgement that it will never happen. Okay. Okay. Take the roll. Mr. Janice. Aye. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Dr. Rentel. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Thank you. 11.03 is um, resolution um, authorizing me to ask the county auditor for um, the certification of the amount to be raised from a renewal of the one mill levy um, put on asked by the Charlie asked by the library for us to place on the ballot for them for the November election. Second. Any questions? This will be the same process that we, essentially the same process that we have followed with the PI renewal is I will, we'll get all this signed, we'll send it up over to the auditor, they will send us back certification. And then at the June meeting, there will be a resolution placing it on the ballot, um, which I will then have to get to the Board of Elections prior to August 6th. Mr. Janice. Aye. Dr. Rentel. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Aye. And just for the record, um, Ms. Deeds is actually recusing herself, not abstaining because of her relationship with the library and that this is actually not a mandatory action that it, it is a voluntary action by the board i think for me it's one we take i take happily because i find that the community um, that the library is such a valuable community resource so i'm i'm happy that we can do this um, for the library wow. i'm done that I'll entertain an emotion to adjourn. I heard a motion hey. and, and they're done second. <laughs> Russ and I Amy? No. 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 I Katie and Oh, Katie and Okay. I, I assume there's no discussion, so you can yeah. take the roll. Yeah. Dr. Rantel. Aye. Ms. Deeds? Aye. Mr. Janice? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. Dr. Corman? Aye. Meeting adjourned. Thank you.